I'm really honored to be here. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. Last time I was here was in 2007, and I was here talking to you about sharks and trying to tell you that I wanted sharks protected and that you had a big involvement in that. But I've got a different story now, and I've sort of changed my tune a little bit. And uh, now I want to convince you that we need to start a revolution. And, uh, and this is why. So as a kid, I was chubby, I stuttered, and I ended up liking animals more than people. So I, many of you might be able to relate to this, but animals were my favorite things in the world, and sharks were the coolest. Sharks weren't chubby, they didn't stutter, they were badass. You know, they were, they've got two more senses than people. They can sense electromagnetic fields, and they can feel movement. They move through the water with absolute grace and agility. Awesome. And so I fell in love with sharks. And as you heard, I took a photo assignment to the Galapagos Islands and found a fishing line that would stretch from Earth to outer space that had hundreds of dead and dying sharks on it. And this made me realize that if sharks are being killed in the most protected places on the planet, then the rest of the world, which is mostly unprotected, is in probably even worse shape. And this slide should be changing. Yes. So uh, I, spent, uh, I spent a year trying to get the word out using magazine articles and newspapers, and nothing happened. I spent my entire uh, savings as a wildlife photographer using magazine articles and newspapers trying to spread the word, but nobody cared. And I realized that nobody cared because it was sort of like championing the plague. Like, why would anyone want to protect sharks? If we eliminate sharks, the oceans will be safer, we can go swimming, everything will be fine. And the reality with sharks is totally different. Every year, sharks kill five people a year. Elephants kill 200 people a year. You're more likely to be killed by a vending machine than you are to be killed by a shark. We swim in the oceans every year in seven billion swimming incidences. And out of those seven billion interactions with sharks, 60 to 90 people get bitten. You know, you couldn't interact with a house cat seven billion times and expect to get messed up only 60 or 90. So sharks are some of the least harmful large predators the planet has. It's been blown way out of proportion. So I tried to make this movie, this little shark film, and I had no idea what I was doing. When I started, my girlfriend bought me two books on how to make movies. A, a book on how to make documentaries and the five C's of cinematography. Uh, I had two movies on my laptop computer, Snatch and Emily, and that was my entire film education. I went to all my photo agencies and my photo editors and I lied and I said I was going to do my next photo assignment with digital cameras. And so I took all the money and I rented the most expensive cameras I could find, uh, the ones George Lucas was shooting Star Wars with. I put it on my parents' credit cards and off I went to go and try to make a shark movie. And if any of you guys know any of the story about shark water, you know, it was supposed to be a pretty underwater movie about sharks with no people in it. And then a few months in, you know, we'd rammed a fishing boat. We were getting charged with attempted murder. The Taiwanese mafia was behind it, all because of how much money there is in shark fins. And so the journey of shark water, five years, nearly killed me, cost way more than money. Every relationship I've ever had was <laughs> due to this movie or cost due to this movie. Um, and the movie came out in China, finally, because the biggest demand for shark fin soup is in China. Uh, and every year we kill more than 100 million sharks to fuel the growing demand for shark fins. And a lot of these sharks are finned, where they're pulled out of the water, the fins are thrown off, and they're thrown right back into the ocean to die. It's enormously wasteful, and it contributes to humans wasting 54 billion pounds of fish every year. Fish that's brought out of the ocean and thrown back, wasted, because it wasn't the most expensive catch. It wasn't what they wanted. So it's an enormously wasteful practice. And finally, we had a premiere in Hong Kong. Yao Ming had done a TV commercial. There were a bunch of shark NGOs. It looked like a huge high for us. But an audience member put up her hand and, and asked me a question at the premiere. And she said, what's the point of stopping us from eating shark fin if, according to the United Nations, all the world's fisheries will have collapsed by the year 2048? And that changed my tune entirely. Like, I had blinders on. I'd been missing the big issue. This issue was much, much bigger than I thought. And it's Dalhousie University, a guy named Boris Worm, who was actually in Sharkwater, who later found out, yeah, if we continue fishing the way we're fishing, we're going to lose all the world's fisheries by the year 2048. So at this movie premiere, I had a bit of a turn, and all of a sudden I knew what my next movie was going to be about. It was going to be about this, about wiping out the oceans. But I quickly found out the issue is a lot bigger than just overfishing. We all know about climate change and that we're burning fossil fuels and putting carbon into the atmosphere, but a lot of the carbon we put into the atmosphere gets absorbed by the oceans, creating carbonic acid. The oceans are 30% more acidic than they were 100 years ago, and that's causing enormous problems throughout ocean ecosystems and food chains. This is called ocean acidification, and according to the, according to the world's top scientists in the world, all the world's coral reefs are expected to be gone somewhere between 2050 and 2100. And coral reefs are enormously important. Coral reefs evolved around 500 million years ago. 
And because of the coral reef evolution, you know, they provided structures and life and food in the oceans. And because of that, life proliferated and life exploded. Shortly after, we had plants in the oceans and then we had sharks. So coral reefs are phenomenally important. And even today, they're responsible for 60% of the world's fisheries. 25% of all the species on planet Earth live on coral reefs, despite them only harboring 2% of the seafloor. It's phenomenally important animals, but we're going to lose them this century if we continue carbon emissions as we are. And I, on the you know, PR tour for this shark film, I ended up meeting all these scientists who, who you know, talked to me about the movie and what we're doing, and they said, what you're doing is cool, but you're missing the point. The point is much, much bigger. It's not saving sharks. It's not hugging trees and saving pandas anymore. It's save the humans now. So if you look at the numbers, deforestation, if deforestation continues where we're at, we won't have any rainforest by the middle of the century. So 2050, this is within our lifetimes, all these things are coming to a head. 2050, at which time we will have 9 billion people on a planet that's struggling to feed and sustain the 7 billion people we have on it right now. Already, 1 billion people around the world don't have enough food. You know, at least 10 million people are dying of starvation every year. 20% of the planet doesn't have enough access to fresh drinking water. And in 20 years, that's going to double. Almost 50% of the planet by the year 2030 won't have fresh drinking water. So we're in a really, really serious situation right now. And this is what changed my mission. You know, if, if, how can we save sharks if we don't have enough food for people? How can we save sharks if we let all the oceans go down? So it changed, changed my tune entirely. And that's why I'm fist pumping revolution. You know, we need massive change. It looks like, according to the world's top scientists, we are in serious trouble, serious trouble, unless we act immediately. But the positive spin to all of this, we've had some massive changes in the past, from the center of slavery, from the center of the women's suffrage movement, or the women's rights movement, or the movement to end apartheid. These looked like phenomenally difficult tasks. But there were a few ingredients that all came together within society to force a massive change. And one of those ingredients was awareness. Everybody knew what was going on. They were aware of a gross atrocity, and they did something about it. It was atrocious that people were oppressed. It was atrocious that slavery was allowed. And it is atrocious right now that we're destroying our life support systems for the sake of industry, for the sake of commerce, for the sake of capitalism. And looking at the system right now, it is apparent that we've built a system that's doomed to fail. Where, does our, where do our dollars come from? Where does our economy come from? Where does this building come from? We take it from the natural world that we depend on for survival, the plants, the trees, the oceans, the birds, the bees. We take that stuff and we're converting it into inanimate objects and eventually waste. We're doing this all over the world. Canada, for example, has the Canadian Alberta tar sands, the biggest, most destructive industrial project in the world. Once they're done, because of our demand for fossil fuels, they will have destroyed an area somewhere between the size of Wales and France combined and Florida. And this is all happening within our lifetimes, putting a plethora of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere when we already know that there's already too much carbon in the atmosphere. We're coming out of an end of a glacial period right now, and a period of a traditional climate stability. When we started the Industrial Revolution, there was 280 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in the last 100 years, we've gone up to 390 parts per million in the atmosphere. 100 years ago, there were 2 billion people on planet Earth. Now there's 7 billion people. We're going to 9 billion people. Why are we going to 9 billion people? Why are we doing this stuff? We need to start questioning this. So my biggest thing is we need radical shift. And we need this radical shift as soon as possible. And this is going to take not just me, it's going to take everyone being a part of it. Every day when you make decisions, you're directing whole economies towards sustainability or towards death and destruction. When you buy something, you're voting with your dollars. You're saying, I want a world that sustains human life, or you're saying, I'm condemning this world, our kids, and our future towards death, destruction, starvation, and crisis. Every time civilizations have gone down this pathway, we know there's archaeological records. Humans have collapsed as civilizations. We've ended up eating each other. Easter Island, it does not look like a bright green future for everybody unless we do something massive. And something massive is underway already. So you can take heart in that. Around the world, there's more than one million non-governmental organizations working for good. They're protecting stuff. They're doing that, and the revolution is underway. We've seen it in Toronto, in Canada, in, in these Occupy movements. People are taking a stand, and they're fighting for something. And I think right now we're in the midst of the biggest battle humanity's ever been in. We need to literally save humanity this century. That's going to be the task that's on my shoulders, that's on your shoulders. You know, we're going to see the world in 2050. And whether we push our governments 
and our corporations to change or not is going to determine whether we live in lack and starvation and crisis or not. So we've got a really, really big issue ahead of us. And the thing that gets me most excited about it is from the center of slavery, from the center of the women's rights movement, you could tell which way you were going. You'd know, okay, people aren't going to be oppressed forever. They will not be slaves forever. Women will not be oppressed forever. You knew you were going to win if you were fighting for the good guys. And right now, I feel the same way. You know, I can tell we're going to win. The movement, you know, one million NGOs around the world is a social force and a social phenomenon the planet has never seen. No government or corporation can combat that, and we have that on our side right now. We have morals on our side. And there have been a few things that have taught me some lessons in this whole project that are really heartwarming and really make me want to continue moving on. And one of them was this little shark movie. So I believed with the shark film that if people just knew what was going on, if they were aware that people were cutting off shark fins, throwing the rest of the body back for the sake of soup, and that this had caused shark populations to drop 90% in 30 years, that they would do something about it. I believed in that firmly. And I thought, okay, you know, we'll put everything we have into making this movie so the public can become aware of this mass atrocity. And about six months ago, I got a phone call from a tiny island in Micronesia. A woman named Kathy Pagapular called me and she said, we've just shown my grade six class your documentary and they're pissed. And they're gonna do something about it. So I sent them some DVDs and a book and said, you know, awesome, have, have fun, good luck, let me know what I can do. And they called me back again and they managed to get legislation put through and passed unanimously through their Senate to entirely ban shark fins. So the issue with shark finning, when we started making shark water, there were four countries that had banned shark finning. When we were finished, there were 16 countries that had banned shark finning. Now there's more than 90 countries around the world that have banned the process of finning, but none of them have banned the importation of fins, which means you can fin as many sharks as you want as long as you put the fins on a shipping boat before you bring them into port, not a fishing boat, which is a massive loophole. So it's the same thing with ivory and the trade in ivory. You can't tell what ivory is from a poached elephant and what isn't from a poached elephant. And with a shark fin, you can't tell if that fin came from a shark that was finned or a shark that was caught sustainably. So the only way forward is going to be massive bans around the world in the ownership, possession, and sale of shark fins, which you might have heard about in Toronto. So I ended up flying to Saipan in Micronesia and meeting a grade six class. In this grade six class, they talked to all their friends, they educated the fishing community on the island, and they managed to make Saipan, in a matter of four months, the second place in the world to entirely ban shark fins. Can't own it, possess it, trade it, nothing. <laughs> on my way out of Micronesia, I stopped in Guam in a grade seven class heard what the grade six class did and said, man, well, if the grade six class can do it, then we can do it too. And so they filled the halls of the Senate so much so that the fishermen couldn't get in to testify. And Guam got shark fin banned in two months. After that, a, a school class in California created a group called I Love Sharks. Two months later, California banned shark fins. A bunch of kids in Toronto started activating, and you know, two weeks ago, the fin-free movement in Canada was born, and it's going around the world, and now the world is starting to ban shark fins all over the place, all because the public did it. I believe entirely that we are all morally bound together, and that if we are made aware of these issues, we'll make different decisions. If you knew your consumption of a dish was causing the demise of one of the oldest, longest lasting, most important predators the planet has, you'd do something about it. You would make a different decision. If your decision is limiting the Earth's ability to carry humans and it's destroying species and ecosystems that we depend on, you would do something different. And that's what happened with the shark movie. People were made aware and they went out and changed the world. We didn't do it. We just told people what was happening and they went out and they fought for it themselves. And so we've been making our next movie. Our next movie is called Revolution. It's the evolution of life on Earth and the revolution to protect it. And I'm giving, in this movie, a lot of the facts that I've given you today. And I hope that now that you guys have some of these facts, you're morally bound to me. And that when you make these decisions in your daily lives, you're going to think about how is this going to affect future generations? How is this going to affect other ecosystems and other species? Am I making the right choice? Because I think now that you're made aware of this, you're going to feel bad if you do the wrong thing. <laughs> and so I've got a couple of things, a couple more seconds here. but. Um, the biggest thing we can all do is watch our consumption, watch our behaviors, watch our, our uh, daily actions. If you ride a bike, if you fly an airplane, if you throw something out, 
I believe in a future, in a future world, if we got this right, we could go to rivers and streams and lakes for fish. We wouldn't have to farm them. We wouldn't be shipping stuff all over the world. You know, if, if you look at Toronto, if you took an aerial picture of Toronto and asked yourself, is this sustainable? I think you'd be crazy if you said this was sustainable. Is Hong Kong sustainable? Is, is any of these major urban centers sustainable? No, they're not sustainable. To feed a monster like this, you've got to take stuff from the natural world, from the whole surrounding areas, and pack it in to this place. So we've got a really big conundrum in us. But the greatest opportunity in all of this is that we've been getting all of that wrong. And I think it's great that a lot of young people are in this room today. And I hope you guys, when you consider the kind of world you're going to create and the kind of jobs and the kind of life you're going to lead, don't go the traditional pathway, because for the last 100 years, we've been getting it wrong, right? Which gives us an opportunity to go out and create new jobs, you know? Don't join a conservation group, start a conservation group. Don't look for a profession, create one. You know, we're in the greatest change that humanity's ever gone through, and it's gonna be in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. And because we have the greatest adversary humanity's ever faced, it's gonna cause the greatest heroes of our generation, the greatest heroes of society of our time to come up and do something about it. And that can be you guys, and it has to be you guys. And I think now that you know this information, it is your duty to go out there and challenge the status quo and say, I'm gonna do something different. I'm not gonna become part of the system. I'm not gonna you know, go to school, get a job, get married, retire, and die, and play golf and drive sports cars because my life sucks so much that I need these things to compensate for it. You can design a beautiful life where you're going to work every day saving stuff, saving species, and protecting the world, and protecting the planet, and working with people that you love if you choose to design your life that way. I've got one little video clip for you, which uh, I shot on my iPhone at, uh, at the Toronto City Council hearing a couple weeks ago when uh, the shark fin ban in Toronto passed 38 to four. And it's a pretty bold move by the Toronto City Councilor what he did here. But uh, you'll see he let go a helium shark blimp in the middle of the City Council hearing because he was so confident the shark fin ban was going to pass. Oh, no. Anybody know how to make that play? It's really funny. <laughs> well, if it's not going to play, I'll tell you what happened. Councillor de Bearmaker walks out with a helium balloon in the middle of the Toronto City Council when they're discussing and debating on whether they should ban shark fin in Toronto. And the issue was, is it a cultural issue? You know, it's our culture to have shark fin soup. Yeah, but this culture perhaps is destroying the world we depend on for survival, so this has to go out. So the confidence level of the city councillors, of everyone there, was so high, he walks out with a helium balloon, lets it go, and if you could see it, it's a remote control helium balloon, and it flaps its little tail around, and it kept going up and up and up, and, this, and the chair of the city councillor was freaking out, Councillor de Bearmaker, you know the rules, you're not allowed to be doing this stuff. And, uh, and that's sort of the punchline. But uh, <laughs> anyways, my whole point is, Changing the world is the most fun, enjoyable, awesome process possible. There's a lot of cool people doing it. In a world where you pick your future, pick that, because you get to wake up every day knowing exactly what you need to do. You know, in a world where we're stuck in video games and all this stuff, and people's lives are lacking meaning, you can have the greatest amount of meaning possible, because you're in the biggest battle ever fought to save humanity and save species and save ecosystems, and you can do it in new and creative ways, like making movies and flying shark blimps. Thanks. <laughs>